We'll call this meeting to order at 6.01. And as usual, we, got a, we have a quorum. So uh, the next item is, are there any changes to the agenda? Recording in progress. Uh, nobody has any changes to the agenda. So then we'll move on to is, uh, the public comment for anybody who has anything to say that is not on the agenda. Do we have anybody here who wish to speak to one of those, something not on the agenda? I don't see any hands or arms or anything else. So we can then move on to the consent agenda. And this is an MPO item. And it's a minor tip amendment that uh, we need to deal with. Move to approve. Is there a second? Yep. All right. All those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Abstain? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to, um, we're, we're without Amy tonight, so Regina is taking minutes, but um, I think Dan seconded who, who moved that? Andy. Andy, Andy. okay, thank you. And so the motion then passes. Hearing no. Next on the agenda is the approve the minutes of March 16th. And do we have a motion for that? Garrett, uh, a motion, so I had a second. Second. All right. Um, I'm gonna let um, Shelburne's alternative uh, member vote on this item. <laughs> Oh, very good. That's right. He was here. Uh, are there um, any uh, corrections to be noted on the uh, minutes? Been called a lot, but never an alternative. <laughs> I just have one little you know, tiny thing. Uh, on page two, lines 34 and 35, I'll say the same thing. It's a bullet point, high criticality. High criticality. <laughs> But that's all I have any, so if there isn't no other corrections, uh, all those in favor of approving the minutes say aye. 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 Any abstentions? I think I should abstain as I wasn't there. Okay. Uh, any, uh, so uh, the, I'm, uh, I'm sorry, who abstained? Uh, uh, Deirdre from Charlotte. Dana, Dana was at the meeting. I'm um I'm here in Dana's place today, but so the motion passes, and then we get to move to some of the the meat of the meeting. Uh, it's an MPO uh, action item, and it's to warn the public hearing for the major a major tip amendment on the Champlain Parkway. I'm gonna ask uh, Christine to kind of you know kind of review the outline of the major tip amendment, and then uh, may have a little follow. -up from uh, the city of Burlington and, and maybe from VTrans if they want. Um, thank you, Charlie. Uh, so the item is a little bit convoluted, so I hope I didn't lose anyone in this description. Um, so what we're doing, there are three projects that are in, involved in this amendment. Um, two for Champlain Parkway and the third is a separate project and we'll talk about that last. But um, basically what's happening here, so so the, um, this has come about because the cost, Champlain Parkway has gone to bid, the bids have come in higher than the cost estimate. We had an estimate in the tip of 35 million and the, es the estimate came in at 62.7 million. So and just to make clear that that number, the 35 million is what was in the tip, it's not what was Burlington's um, previous cost estimate. So this is changing in the amount in the tip. Um, because as we talk about frequently, the tip is fiscally constrained, which means that we're limited by the dollar amount that we can have in the tip. We were looking for um, a way to add this money based on any projects in the tip that are not, that have fun funding that are, is not gonna need them. <clears throat> Excuse me. And so, 
This is primarily coming from the Exit 17 project. This project has excess funds in our TIP as compared to what's in the Transportation Capital Program. So this change in the years of 22, FY22, FY23, and FY24 do not take money that, that is needed by that project. It's taking excess funds. Um, so when you look at the agenda item, you'll see that there is um, a funding schedule for each year, 22, 23, 24, 25. And it's a combination of taking funds that are available from the TIP. And then um, we're talking about releasing some of the excess funds to VTrans that then we will look to program back into this project in FY25. VTrans has agreed to um, this proposal, I believe they can speak if they uh, have something else to say about it. There is at the end about, um, let's see, 9 million plus uh, about 4 million that will be funded outside of the fiscal constraint. Their money, it's money that just cannot fit within our fiscal constraint limit. Um, and this is for phase one of Champlain Parkway, which is Home Avenue to Kilburn Street. Um, so the change is to Champlain Parkway that's on the front side. Um, exit 17 is on the back side of your agenda item. Um, I'll let Burlington speak to the reasons for the changes. And then uh, just to call your attention to there's one project that seems like it doesn't belong with these, but this is just another major tip amendment to add a a bridge project on Route 7 in Williston. It's a major amendment because it's a new project to the tip. And, um, and Champlain Parkway is a major amendment because of the cost increase. So if you want to talk about any more details, I'm happy to go into more detail. Um, if not, uh, should I turn it over to Chapin or Norm to talk a little bit about the reasons for this increase? Yeah, Chapin. Great. Thank you so much, Christine, for having us. Chapin Spencer, Director of Public Works. And first, thank you to the Regional Planning Commission Board for your patience over the years shifting this project uh, uh, in many out years. Uh, and I am pleased to say that after decades of diligent work with VTrans, Federal Highway, the RPC, and partners, we are now doing what many think is unthinkable which is bringing this legacy project to construction. Uh, I'll have city engineer Norm Baldwin and uh, senior engineer Corey Mims uh, provide an overview of just how uh, the bids came in and, and where we're at financially. <coughs> so Norm and Corey, we yeah, we see the image, but we don't hear you. Sorry, didn't hit the mute button. Sorry. So you should see the image of the route for the parkway itself. Does anyone see that? Okay, good. So perfect. Um, so this is a depiction of the segments that uh, Christine was referring to. This project was broken up into two different phases. The first phase being uh, the connection between Home Avenue and Kilburn Street. And uh, there was significant conversation about um, how this project would be coordinated with other projects within the city, particularly in the south end. Um, we have the Shelmer Street Roundabout ongoing right now. We have the uh, Rail Yard Enterprise advancing. There have been significant conversations about uh, EJ issues within the King Street, Maple Street neighborhood, and uh, how making these final connections to the project would affect them. And so I think this plan has, has been responsive to both what the state and federal process requires, but also to our local community. And so that's why we've broken it out in the two separate phases. You can see the red segments are the balance of the project to be completed in phase two, which follows phase one. So yes, we did have a bid process and um, this is just the uh, South End coordination plan that I referred to in terms of all the number of different projects going on. What's important here is to understand how the sequence of work will occur and that uh, we have only really primarily two means of access to the city north and south, uh, Shelburne Road and uh, Pine Street itself with Shelburne Road roundabout in place. 
we've had to coordinate those project schedules. So uh, let's see, next slide. Uh, I'm not going to get into the merits of the project and its details, but um, uh, I think what's important to uh, the board is really what the estimate was and what the uh, bid we received was. And so the engineer's estimate was 26 million in excess of 26 million came in at just short of 41 million, leaving a difference of 14 million over a three year period that was in excess of our estimate. Below is just a listing of our local match obligations that came with that we as a city have to assume that we presented to council. Uh, and then the series of uh, reasons we believe uh, drove up the cost of the project. One is, of course, as everyone knows, uh, Russian forces invading Ukraine has had impacts on our energies. Uh, uh, inflation has gone incredibly high all at once. Uh, and then you have uh, what we believe is a competing market for uh, contractors' um, time and effort. They uh, have obviously a lot of work that's backlogged from as a result of COVID. They have staffing issues in terms of uh, people transitioning out of the workforce. And it's been, I think, a challenge for contractors to, to really staff up and deal with the volume work that's in front of them. As a result, they're selective about the work that they are bidding on and uh, are unfortunately a, a narrow market of competitive contractors in the in this in this work. We've seen other pricing come in higher than uh, what was reasonably expected in a recent past, and we've also seen material costs going strangely right through the roof. Uh, I. It's my belief that this project, because it's got such a long duration of construction and scale and complexity, that contractors are uh, uh, had uh, covered their their risks by having an exceptionally high price, more than we would reasonably expect in a competitive market. So, all these things combined have made for a so-called perfect storm of financial challenge with this project. But we believe if we were to re try to repackage this at a later date that it would have more serious consequences, both from a permitting standpoint, but also um, would we get any more competitive pricing than we already have? And we don't believe, at least in the near term, in the next five years that we're gonna see that. So we think this is the, the best approach to move forward with. And we've, we've consulted with Federal Highway in the state of Vermont and uh, they are in agreement. They've had our, we've submitted our bid analysis, that bid analysis, has been um, accepted by VTrans and forwarded to Federal Highway, who is in a con concurrence to uh, proceed with the award. So there's been a significant amount of work to talk through this complex issue, but we are here tonight to seek your support to, to continue forward and advance this project. There's just a other longer list of, and then a, a Perspective schedule of, of things and events that we need to, steps we need to follow through, milestones we need to follow through to arrive at a commencement of construction. And I will stop sharing unless people want to see more or ask questions. Norm, could you go back to that, that timeline that you had? Because this is, yep. I mean, we're looking at the tip through FY25, but this is going to go past FY25, right? Apologies for making you go backwards can, here. Can you uh, see? Can you? Can probably, you see I'm that? just can you see that now? Bringing, bringing this up. Um, just yep. can for, see uh, that? Yep. Okay. So, um, um, not, not that schedule, Norm, the, the big construction schedule oh. that showed it going out over years. Yeah, the south end sequencing schedule. Yeah. Okay. And Pearl, I just wanted to kind of um, have the board focus on that for a moment that, you know, this is not, this doesn't end in FY25, even though that's what's in the TIP amendment. It's going okay. through 26 and 27, uh, probably, uh, I don't know, I don't know if I should cross my fingers or, or what, what emotion to put on that, but um, that's, that's the projected schedule right now, right? Yes. 
and it's, it appears to be holding, but obviously as we get further down through this process of all the other projects that may change. Mm -hmm. I think a critical project to that is the rail yard enterprise project. And uh, I think council's expectation is that that makes significant progress before the next phase of parkway is advanced because of all the expressed EJ issues that we've talked about. Yeah, that's that's a really important one. Thank you. And yep. Sorry, Catherine, I don't want to steal the chair's gavel here, but uh, John Zaccone has his hand up. Uh, just a quick question. I don't know if it's just a only includes one phase or not, but um, you just told us that the bid went up to $41 million in the packet we received. We were informed that the amount has gone from 35 million to 62 million, almost 63. So there's a, the, those, not, those numbers are not jibing and I'm trying to understand yeah. what, so, what the bill is. So the answer to that is it, it's, um, I think the 62 million is all inclusive of both phase one and phase two, and also all soft costs that are anticipated. There was um, an adjustment or a re reconciliation of what it would take to actually um, construct the project, both from RE services, environmental services, um, force account engineering within our team, so on and so forth, all those costs that go with not just the construction costs, but support to, to bring it forward. So the, the 41 million is the full cost of just phase one? I would, um, absolutely. Uh, the construction costs. 41 million is just the construction cost. That's correct. Thank you, Corey. Okay, of just phase one. Correct. Just phase one, that's correct. Okay, thank you. Well, why don't you back. stop sharing so we can see everybody's uh, questions? And I was going to actually I, see if the financial. I have a point of clarification to that item is that um, since the 35 million was the entire project. And so for the way that we look at our what constitutes a major amendment, we need to compare apples to apples. So that's why that overall cost was the full amount. And um, there is a schedule in the TIP amendment that talks about what's gonna be in phase two and what the amount per year is that we expect to happen past the four year window of the TIP. All right, Catherine, you're still muted, but um, I think uh, Jackie has her Sorry. hand. I have, I'm still working on that cough, <laughs> sucking on the cough drop here. <laughs> okay, Jackie, thank you. So I'm not sure this question is appropriate, but I'm curious, you know, since you're taking money out of the Exit 17 project, um, because you say it's, it was X kind of, I hear extra, what's to say the costs for that aren't going to go way beyond what is anticipated and will we be in sort of the same situation when that actually comes to construction um, i think for that point we we develop we reevaluate the tip every year so we will continue to monitor that um, what we're reflecting is what's in the current transportation capital program vtrans's budget and yeah we will uh, we will adjust it every year at, if it's necessary Any other questions, comments? Hearing none, are you ready to um, vote on the, uh, the amendment to the tip? Well, uh, and I just wanna be clear, we're voting on uh, warning a public hearing for the next right. meeting. Exactly, that's true. Yep, so uh, although the, yeah, what's in the document says approve the tip, I think, um, is that, uh, Christine, is that what the TAC recommended was to approve the amendment? Um, I'm sorry, I I did. Um, it's just going to public hearing. Oh, well, it says it's, to it's recommend the title is tip, yeah. tip amendments, but the issue is to warn a public hearing. Um, the word the wording for the TAC is to warn a hearing, and oh, I'm sorry, I, I the typically the is to warn a public hearing and approve, but I think we didn't have the final numbers for the TAC, so they are going to hear this at their next meeting. So they haven't made a recommendation yet. So I'd move to warn for a public hearing. 
I'll second. second it. All those in favor, say aye, and it is the MPO. Uh, no, it, aye. It, Aye. 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 Any uh, abstentions or um, any no's? Hearing none, the motion passes. Uh, now that the public hearing um, vote is behind us, can uh, someone from staff, Charlie, Christine, uh, whoever it is, please provide us what our actual authority is here? This project has its detractors, as we all know. Um, and if we have the power to kibosh everything because of uh, it needs all of this additional money, um, some of us are liable to get uh, lobbied, if you will. And when citizens come to us, it's very important that we understand, first off, what our actual authority is as a commission. So I'm not trying to say I want anything done or I want to block anything or approve anything or anything like that. I just want to know what our authority is. So when, uh, if we actually wanted to vote no on this, can, is the project die? I mean, just what, what is it? Please so tell us what our authority is so that when people approach us, we yeah. can actually um, talk intelligently to them about what it is that we need to do. Yes, yeah, so thanks for asking, John. Um, and so I think this is probably a good conversation to just MPO authority in general, right? MPOs were created in the 60s after the interstate era and local governments didn't have a voice in the decisions that DOTs were making, you know, putting interstates through cities, et cetera, right? And so we, uh, you all have a pretty blunt instrument power. Um, you could vote not to include this in the tip and not allow federal funding to be used for this project. Um, however, um, that doesn't come without any implications, right? Um, and so uh, my understanding is that, you know, Federal Highway and VTrans have communicated uh, to the city that there's a $45 million payback of federal and state funds that have been extended, expended to date on this project that would need to be paid back. Um, and that's, so just so you know, <laughs> yes, yes, you could vote no, but you know, there's dominoes that happen after that. And I don't know if either the city or VTrans wants to add anything to that comment. Or Matthew? Yeah. yeah um, I just wanted to add that, bear in mind that this project has already been authorized by Federal Highway Administration. So they've already authorized um, the amount that we had in the tip. So we're looking for the difference in the funding here. So uh, if the MPO were to decide not to fund the additional amount, then the, at that point, the, the city would have to decide whether to proceed forward and find the money elsewhere or to not continue with the project and face paying back uh, 45, 49 million, something like that. That's substantial. Thank you. Does that answer your question? Oh, it answers my question. I just wanted to make sure everyone, not just myself, was uh, understanding of what our authority is, because like I said, that's the only way that when people approach us, we can have an intelligent conversation with them. So I appreciate the time. Thank you. Are there any other comments or questions <clears throat> before we move on then? Uh, sort of uh, apply in the background. Otherwise, we're moving on to uh, warning the uh, public hearing for the UPWP and budget. Yeah, so um, I'll, I'll try to address this one. So this is another uh, action vote to warn a public hearing for the work program and budget for the May meeting. Um, you got the work program, the draft work program, the draft budget uh, were separate links um, on the website. Um, hope you had a chance to look at them. Um, yeah, uh, you're welcome to the city. Uh, thanks, Norm. Uh, and uh, the uh, the thing I think I want to spend the most time on is, is maybe the budget document, um, which you know is just a couple page summary kind of of what's in the work program. Um, 
And this work program process uh, was a little different than previous years, uh, in part um, two reasons. We had more money, or, or there were two reasons why we had significantly more money in, from a MPO funding standpoint. Uh, one is was the Infrastructure uh, and Jobs Act that uh, increased our funding by about 30% of MPO funding. Um, and that's you know in the realm of five to seven hundred thousand dollars a year between federal highway and FTA funds, and um, and Chris, I hope I don't mischaracterize. Um, Chris Jolly from Federal Highway informed us that there were also some excess federal highway funds available, you know, in the realm of around five hundred thousand. So there was quite a bit of uh, additional funding compared to previous years available this year. Um, if you remember, I think I sent out a uh, encouragement email uh, early or probably around the end of the calendar year saying, hey, there's more money available. Please apply. And uh, and you all listened. Um, <laughs> so, uh, and so that had a couple of effects. So we got about one point eight million dollars of uh, MPO funded requests, you know, and going back in years past, we were more like one point two, maybe one point three. Uh, in that realm, it was a little bit more last year, uh, again, as we were trying to uh, invest some of the available funds that, that hadn't been used previously. But um, there's, there was a significant increase um, and probably about um, 20 more projects than normal um, were added to our overall work program. Uh, some of that was MPO funding, but there were also other dynamics going on uh, in the state uh, which I'll touch on uh, briefly, but so that's kind of the big picture. Um, just to let you know, uh, and the UPWP committee chaired by Chris Shaw uh, walked through all of these projects and you know uh, have recommended this to you all uh, for consideration. And so I don't know, any big any questions about kind of the big picture. Um, okay, um, and then I'm gonna. Let me know if you want me to pull up the budget. I'm just gonna do a little walk through the budget just because it gives you a, kind of the broad perspective of what's happening in the work program. Um, and so I, I'm not gonna pull it up unless somebody asks. So, and first we talk about the municipal and regional uh, funding. Um, you'll see there's a yellow highlight in the dollar amount for FY23. And that's really noting that the legislature is having discussion in their budget about increasing the amount of the regional planning funds going to RPC statewide. Um, and you'll note in red text uh, in column B that it may be about 150,000. Uh, that's the average per RPC. Uh, we tend to get a little bit higher share. So it could be more than $150,000 uh, increase in that particular line item. Uh, which would be very helpful for our kind of general regional planning tasks. Um, and uh, you'll see that there's more money in that direct line uh, because we don't have the staff capacity to spend those funds right now. And uh, I certainly didn't want to hire without knowing if that money is really coming or not. Um, so that may create a little opportunity to, for us to do some more uh, general planning work than we've had in the past. Sorry, I spent a little bit more time on that uh, than normal. Um, the, uh, and I don't know if there's other things to touch on here. Uh, we're still working on the SEDS um, and other uh, municipal assistance. Uh, you also see that line has gone from like 50,000 last year to 70,000. So we're getting more requests kind of for, uh, I'll call it kind of consulting assistance from the planning staff. Any questions on the municipal regional planning section? Okay. Um, for the transportation section, um, you'll see kind of an increase in staff time there of about uh, 10%. Um, that is largely due to the idea of hiring an equity manager uh, and spending more time on equity work, um, and particularly with MPO funding. And that's a, a big emphasis for USDOT right now. Um, and then looking further at the transportation section, you'll see on row 21 that there's over a million dollar increase in consultant funding. And so that's really where you're seeing that impact of additional funds available. Um, 
you know, we're not hiring a lot more transportation staff to manage those projects. And Eleni would want me to say yet at this point. Um, but, you know, we're kind of, we're trying to see how efficient we can be with existing staff. Uh, but there is a significant increase uh, coming through that, that line. Um, and any questions on the transportation funding program? And obviously I mentioned those 20 extra projects. Most of them are in that MPO section. Okay. Um, going down to the natural resource and energy section, <clears throat> you'll see some yellow highlighted rows. Uh, we have a, a four or $500,000 brownfield grant that's pending. We'll hear about that in the next couple months. There's another uh, funding program uh, under consideration of the legislature for municipal uh, building energy retrofits. Um, well, no, no, it's municipal resiliency, I think. <laughs> so it's, I don't know, it's been having a couple different names as it's going through the legislature. Um, but they're uh, talking about providing some funding to the RPC staff to help municipalities access about $40 million of state and federal funds that will be available uh, for weatherization or energy conversion um, and all kinds of you know, energy improvements to municipal buildings. Uh, so that's what that line is. Um, and then you see uh, water quality uh, programming. Uh, we've talked the last two or three years about being a clean water service provider. You see that on rows 45 and 46. Um, the DEC is, and please flag me if I'm using any acronyms that need to be expounded on, um, but the Department of Environmental Conservation is providing a grant to us for about 650, 640,000, something like that, uh, to do natural resource based projects in Basin 5, which uh, is kind of the watershed that is along Lake Champlain and also includes uh, a lot of Grand Isle County um, and a little bit of Franklin County too, um, including St. Albans. Uh, so that's a big chunk there. And then emergency management and health. Uh, you'll see the health department uh, has uh, gotten uh, a pretty significant grant to deal with uh, health equity. And that's actually impacting our work program in a couple of those, you know, two or three of those different yellow lines um, as they're working on how to have um, more healthy community design and address equity issues. And there's a little, uh, a smaller grant for hot, hot weather emergency response planning. So those are, I'm hoping that was helpful covering some of the pending new things uh, that look like they're coming through the budget this year in the legislature, which we should know in the next couple of weeks as they go into conference to sort out the differences between House appropriations vote and Senate appropriations um, and what came out of the two houses. Um, any questions on the revenue side for a budget? Um, you'll note a big, you know, it's a $2 million increase over last year in total. Um, all right. Don't see any questions yet. <clears throat> yeah, no, all right. Nobody got too scared yet except me. Okay, great. Um, <laughs> Well, and, and staff. <laughs> so, um, on the, the back, the, the next page of the budget is our expense side. And you see uh, salaries. Uh, and I, I, meant, I forgot to mention one thing about the clean water so service provider work is that we are also uh, working on hiring another person in our business office because there's going to be, you know, I don't know, 20 or something, probably new contracts just related to that clean water service provider. So our admin work is gonna go up significantly uh, in the coming years. Um, and between that and the equity manager is the, that you know, kind of, that's a big part of that 12% increase in our salary line, which is, you know, our biggest investment is in staff. Um, you know, it's around 80% of our operating uh, budget exclusive of the consultant work. Um, not too much else notable, you know, kind of minor things otherwise on the expense line. And we are working on refining some of these numbers. So when you see it, uh, what I hope is the final version next month, there may be a couple little tweaks as we're kind of doing the fine tooth combing through this. Um, any questions on the expense side of the budget? 
at this point. And then, um, not hear anything. No, I wanted, uh, the executive committee asked me to spend a few extra minutes, and I'm gonna apologize to John Moore right now, uh, <laughs> who's, who's next up, on our indirect rate, um, down at the bottom of the second page there, uh, rows like uh, 113 to 122, uh, on the lower right, you'll see uh, a little indirect rate history. And it's just uh, something that I think the board you know, doesn't hear too much about, um, but there's a, a lot of our staff time or a good chunk of our staff time. And of course, you know, our rent and those other uh, kind of overhead expenses go into this federally uh, approved system of being part of an indirect rate. So things that can't be directly charged to a contract go into this indirect rate. And you see how our rate uh, has been approved by VTRANS every year. You see that on the in column, I can't see the, the heading, but uh, the approved indirect rate column, and then it gets audited, we have an actual indirect rate, and it gets reconciled every year, uh, really by Forrest, and then reviewed by VTRANS for approval. Um, and depending on the outcome of the audited actual numbers, we have to adjust our rate. So if we over collect one year, we have to, and we get, then we get audited kind of the, the second year, and this is on a two year cycle. So we're in FY22, we got the FY21 audit informs our FY23 indirect rate. Um, and so, and, and of course the even years move together also. And so there's been some fluctuation in our indirect rate. We over collect one year and then two years later, we have to under collect. We've been trying to reduce the fluctuations, uh, but you can see FY21, we had significant revenue over expenses of 86,000. So that means that probably FY23, and if you look at the bottom line of our budget um, is minus 52,000. The reason for that is because we have to under collect our indirect expenses in FY23 to compensate or mitigate the over collection in FY21. I'm sorry, I, I know I feel like a really detail oriented bureaucrat right now. And I apologize because I think half of you want to go to sleep right now, but um, is there anything, uh, <laughs> did, the, did I raise any questions in that overview? Was it helpful? Was it helpful at all? <laughs> all right, thank you. Somebody nodded yes, thank you. And I, don't, and I don't see any hands up for questions or anything either. I thought it was a great summary. Thanks, Charlie. <laughs> Forrest, I pay you to say that. <laughs> Uh, um, okay, yeah, so, um, so uh, Madam Chair, we're looking for a motion to warn this Republic hearing for next month. Yes. Garrett motions to do so. Do we have a second? Ms. Bard, I will second that. Thank you, Bard. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Great. Aye. Uh, looks like the motion passes uh, and the uh, uh, UPWP will be warned. We now have a nice a presentation uh, by John Moore of GMT to talk about its proposed service reductions. Yes, uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is John Moore. I'm the general manager at Green Mountain Transit. And uh, give me a second so I can share my screen. Can everybody see that? Okay, yes. great. Um, and I will start with a uh, little bit of a spoiler alert um, in that this agenda item is listed as GMT proposed service reductions. But I'm happy to report that just yesterday, the GMT Board of Commissioners did vote to uh, avoid the implementation of the vast majority of our planned service reductions. So tonight's presentation will be more of a general uh, budgetary overview of uh, GMT and uh, highlight some of the uh, challenges that we're facing, but also some of the opportunities that we see in FY23 and beyond. 
So I'll start with a, a quick summary of some ridership, ridership uh, trend data. Um, and this really starts back in July of uh, 2019. Uh, so about eight months before the pandemic hit. And as you can see and probably expected, um, we saw a dramatic uh, reduction in ridership uh, around March uh, 2020. Um, since that time, you can see that uh, we've been uh, kind of on a pattern of increasing and then dipping in ridership and then increasing again, uh, which generally follows the COVID case counts. So, um, you know, pretty logical. Um, you know, just to put it in perspective, in uh, fiscal year uh, 19, which was the uh, last full year pre-pandemic, uh, we provided about 2.3 million uh, passenger boardings. Uh, in FY22, uh, that was down to about uh, 1.2 million. Um, and then as you can see from this chart, you know, we are trending um, at the moment down a little bit, but uh, certainly have increased from the uh, real um, decreases that we saw early in the pandemic. So in terms of our uh, revenue sources, um, this is an important chart because we are publicly funded. Um, we get uh, our revenues from four primary sources. Uh, for FY23, uh, this is a little skewed because we're still using um, some federal COVID relief funds. Um, so our federal um, revenue amounts are higher than they typically are, and our state and uh, operating revenues are lower than they typically are. Um, but as you can see, 60% um, in federal funding, including those COVID relief funds, 7% uh, from the state of Vermont, 22% uh, in local funds. So in Chittenden County, that's from our eight member municipalities in Colchester. Um, and that 3.5 million funds the fixed route service in addition to the ADA uh, paratransit service uh, operated by SSTA under contract uh, to GMT. And then the operating revenues of 1.7 uh, is primarily made up of our uh, passenger fares. Um, and we'll talk more about that in a few right. slides, uh, but that is um, down significantly based on the ridership um, chart that I just showed. So I just wanna give a quick overview. Um, you folks are certainly aware and um, familiar with federal funding, uh, but like a lot of federal funds, uh, federal transit administration funding does have matching requirements. Um, so operational uh, expenses do require a 50% non-federal match. Um, and I did highlight that fuel is considered an operating expense, not a maintenance expense. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more uh, about some of the pressures we're seeing with our fuel budget. And then uh, in terms of maintenance capital and uh, new start um, costs, those all have a 20% uh, non-federal uh, matching requirement. And I do wanna just highlight that uh, with the IIJA, um, there has been a 35% increase in federal transit funding, uh, which is really good news. Um, but that non-federal match is really the limitation that GMT is facing. And, um, you know, that's the area that we're focusing on to make sure we have uh, the non-federal match to maximize all of that increase in uh, federal transit uh, um, financing. So I'll get into uh, our FY23 budget a little bit. Um, you know, we try to follow the municipal uh, budgeting cycle as much as possible as we do collect uh, assessments from our member municipalities. So we really started our FY23 budgeting, um, you know, last summer, and obviously a lot has changed since then. And in the next slide, I'll outline some of those changes. Um, but in terms of the fixed route assessment, which is the local um, funding uh, in transit, um, we typically have a three to 4% annual increase. Uh, FY23 was a 4% increase, which generated uh, an additional uh, $90,000. Um, and that's a, a 2.26 million uh, total local investment in transit. Um, when you add um, the uh, ADA paratransit service, that's how you get that 3.5 million uh, number from the um, pie chart. Um, originally, we balanced our FY23 uh, budget um, with about 6,000 hours of uh, service reductions planned. Um, that was about 5% of our total uh, Chittenden County service that we provide. Um, and those proposals included uh, reducing service on the Shelburne Road and North Avenue routes uh, from a bus running every 20 minutes during uh, the rush hour to every 30 minutes during the rush hour. And then also eliminating uh, four uh, daily Montpelier uh, link trips. Um, again, uh, as of yesterday, uh, we are going to avoid 
uh, any service reductions on the Shelburne and North Ave route. So we'll continue the 20 minute um, peak hour service. And in, uh, instead of eliminating four daily Montpelier link trips, uh, we're only going to eliminate two of those um, with the current plan. The 23 budget as originally um, approved by the board um, also included $1.58 million in passenger fare collection. Uh, we have uh, been operating uh, without a fare since the start of the pandemic, uh, but our budget currently does assume that we will uh, restart fare collection in July. Um, that 1.58 million number is based on our current ridership projections, which uh, are still about um, 20 percent uh, less than what we uh, had for pre-pandemic ridership. And that's important to note because um, we collected about 2.3 million in passenger fares before the pandemic. So that $700,000 uh, in revenue difference uh, has not been offset uh, in cost savings. Um, we've had more of a focus on getting people back on the bus, uh, you know, as we come out of the pandemic. And, uh, you know, it's, we feel it's very counterproductive to, um, you know, reduce our service and, you know, uh, that would have a spiraling effect in terms of more ridership loss. Um, so we think it's the right move, but it's certainly a financial uh, impact uh, when your revenues drop $700,000 and uh, you don't uh, reduce your expenses uh, in a similar uh, fashion. Um, our 23 budget also included about 200,000 in uh, reserve funding. Um, that's important because through the pandemic, uh, receiving these COVID relief funds, uh, we have had uh, an internal goal of meeting our fund balance uh, policy, which is having two months uh, or about $2 million of cash on hand. Uh, we've currently uh, met that goal for the first time in a very long time. Um, and so taking the 200,000 out of that, you know, did uh, have some impacts there. Um, and then another uh, cost increase we're seeing is in our ADA program. Um, SSTA, uh, as I mentioned, provides that service under contract to GMT. Um, that service provides um, uh, service uh, in a three quarter of a mile buffer around the fixed route service uh, for folks that are unable to take, um, you know, the regular city bus um, due to a variety of reasons. Um, like GMT, their fuel costs and labor costs are going up. So there are certainly some uh, cost pressures there. Um, but there's also uh, just a general increase in demand for that service as the population ages, uh, more folks qualify for that door-to-door -door, um, paratransit service. So we do expect um, additional um, cost pressures in that program. And then lastly, um, our FY23 budget, um, you know, does consider um, that uh, we are in the second year of uh, two new collective bargaining agreements that we uh, executed um, in the fall. Um, we feel uh, very happy to have uh, reached agreements with our union uh, partners. Um, but um, while we feel that we're paying market rates, those market rates have increased uh, during the pandemic, um, especially for uh, commercial drivers and skilled mechanics. Uh, there's a severe shortage uh, of those um, uh, employees in the area. Um, and because of that, um, the wages in those uh, job classifications have certainly increased uh, since our, our last uh, collective bargaining agreement. So uh, that's put some more pressure uh, on our budget. Um, as I mentioned, uh, a lot has changed uh, since we started our FY23 uh, budgeting. Um, and similar to what you heard with the Champlain Parkway project, um, we have experienced uh, some uh, recent uh, uh, cost increases. Um, you know, number one, restoring the service uh, that we had originally planned uh, in our 23 budget uh, adds about $275,000 in cost back uh, to our 23 budget. Um, and then fuel is a real wild card right now. Uh, we are uh, expecting to pay about $500,000 more in FY23 than we originally budgeted. Uh, and that's based on uh, an original budgeted amount of uh, $2.75 per gallon. Uh, we're currently paying about $4.35 a gallon. So we're likely going to adjust our budget to $4.25 per gallon. Um, we are uh, planning on removing the, the $200,000 in uh, reserve funds, again, with a, a strong internal goal of having that uh, two month of operating cash on hand. We think that's uh, incredibly important. Um, and then we are uh, currently awaiting uh, the award of our state operating funds. 
there's an annual uh, application process that we go through with the Agency of Transportation. Um, and that's really what dictates the timeline of our, our budget adjustment. Uh, typically, we get that grant award sometime around uh, July 1st. Um, but we are expecting about $1 million less in state operating funds than what we uh, typically received before the pandemic. Uh, for 23, we do have uh, $2.2 million uh, of COVID relief funds left that will offset that. Um, but after 23, uh, we will be out of our COVID relief funds. So if we don't get back to pre-pandemic state operating levels, um, that will put a lot of pressure uh, on our budget, um, mostly in that uh, every dollar we get in state operating, we can leverage another dollar of federal funds. So every dollar reduction in state operating is really $2 uh, in revenue reductions to GMT. So that's, that's very critical. Uh, and then lastly, um, the current versions of the House and Senate Transportation Committee passed uh, transportation bills, uh, H736, uh, includes between $1.2 and $1.4 million uh, for GMT in FY23. Um, there are some differences in the flexibility um, for the two versions of the bill. Um, the House version is the 1.4 million uh, amount, um, but that would be restricted to zero fare. Um, and then the Senate version is a lower amount, that 1.2 million, but provides some additional flexibility to GMT on how that is spent. And um, I will illustrate why that's important here um, in a few slides. Um, so a general summary of all of those uh, FY23 uh, budget adjustments, uh, they all add up to about a $1 million uh, deficit um, from what we had originally budgeted. Um, and so we really have two options um, to uh, fill that hole. The option number one, um, and this is what we would do if we don't get the additional uh, legislative money from the transportation bill, um, we, we do have about $1 million we're projecting in unspent uh, COVID relief funds from our FY22 budget. Um, that again is uh, significantly impacted by the price of fuel, um, but we feel relatively confident we'll have somewhere in the $1 million range at the end of this fiscal year. Um, so that would um, fill that deficit. Uh, or uh, if we were to get the uh, money in the transportation bill, uh, we would use um, roughly a half a million of that to leverage the same amount of uh, 5307 federal funding. We would uh, balance the budget that way. We would keep the 1 million uh, in unspent COVID relief funds uh, for 24 and beyond. And then we would, uh, our board would then make a policy decision on how to spend that additional uh, 700,000 or so of uh, T-bill funding. Uh, either for some level of continued zero fare service in fiscal year 23, uh, or um, saving that money uh, for, uh, to avoid future service reductions. Um, and that's where the flexibility that's included in the Senate transportation version of the uh, T-bill uh, becomes important um, for, as you'll see on this next slide, um, as we look at our 24 budget outlook, um, again, assuming that our revenues uh, generally stay flat, uh, fuel stays at $4.25 a gallon, uh, in that our ridership does not rebound to uh, full pre-pandemic pre levels uh, in, in FY24. Um, we've looked at three different scenarios. Uh, all three scenarios assume that we avoid the service reductions in 23, which our board voted yesterday. Uh, all three assume that we get 1.2 million in additional legislative funding and really the only difference is uh, the fare free piece in, in fiscal year 23. Um, so you can see that um, if we were to remain fare free in fiscal year 23, it's gonna create about a $750,000 uh, local fund deficit in FY 24. Uh, if we were to operate uh, only half the year uh, fare free in FY 23, we'll have about a $56,000 uh, surplus in local funds to start FY 24. And if we were to charge a fare uh, starting in July, we'd have about a $1 million uh, surplus in uh, local funds. Um, and while that is uh, excellent news, um, I will say our very early projections of FY25 is that we will need all of that $1 million uh, and then some uh, in local funds to balance our FY25 budget. So um, in summary, uh, we're, planning on minimal service reductions in FY23 uh, per the board uh, action yesterday. And then uh, next month in May, 
the, the board uh, will make a policy decision uh, on uh, the zero fare status for FY23. Um, that will be pending uh, T-bill funding, and it will really be an exercise in balancing um, you know, what we can afford uh, in FY23 versus what we know we're going to need in non-federal uh, dollars in FY24 and 25. Um, one option that we've discussed internally is a mean uh, a means tested program uh, in that there would be some eligibility, uh, income eligibility uh, requirements. And if folks were eligible um, based on income, we would allow them to continue uh, zero fare for FY23. So that could be a way to provide um, you know, the benefit of uh, a fare free service to the folks that need it the most while um, you know, trying to uh, balance our budget um, by collecting fares from folks that may not need that um, economic uh, relief. And so um, the biggest takeaway uh, is that, you know, we need additional non-federal funding in, in future years. Uh, we can balance 23 um, and we can uh, balance 24 based on what the decision is uh, for uh, fare collection in, uh, in FY23. Um, but we're going to continue to face uh, cost pressures. Uh, we think fuel is going to stay high for uh, the foreseeable future. Um, you know, it's still unclear uh, the impacts of teleworking and other COVID-related uh, um, uh, reasons for, for ridership rebounding. And then lastly, our ADA program, we do expect as the population ages, uh, we'll continue to see uh, more demand in that program, which will increase the costs. Um, and so all of this does highlight um, the needs identified in the CCRPC transit financing study. Um, and I think GMT, uh, working with uh, the CCRPC and VTRANS, uh, will uh, certainly focus uh, our legislative outreach this summer and beyond uh, on that uh, study uh, and really the need for uh, more sustainable non-federal um, funding of transit in the state of Vermont. Um, so that's what I have tonight, and I'll stop sharing, and I'm happy to answer any questions you folks may have. Thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> given that uh, you know the stat of the ridership often drops when the gas prices go down, would you expect that ridership will increase with uh, the increase in gas prices for people? Normally, yes. Um, you know, back in two thousand eight is when we had our all time record ridership when fuel prices were at all time record highs. The one difference, of course, is COVID and really teleworking um, and trying to figure out what the long-term impacts uh, of teleworking are. Um, you know, we support teleworking. You know, it does reduce uh, VMTs, which, you know, is part of our mission. Um, but it certainly, uh, when you look at our link routes, especially uh, the Montpelier link, uh, particularly, um, we're only at about 30% of the pre-pandemic ridership and, um, you know, a large reason for that is, uh, you know, folks in Waterbury and, and Montpelier being able to telework. So um, it's kind of a new uh, scenario that, um, you know, there's not a lot of uh, industry literature or research on, um, you know, what the long-term impacts of this will be. So um, the, the long answer uh, is we don't know, but uh, typically, yes, higher fuel prices do uh, result in higher uh, transit demand. Are there uh, other questions or comments to be had? Oh, okay, I don't see anybody's hand. Well, thank you very much for your presentation. It was quite uh, useful. Sure, thank you. Uh, given that there were no questions or comments, uh, the next thing on the agenda is the <clears throat> Board Development Committee uh, FY23 Executive Committee nominations. You want me to jump right in, Catherine? Yes, because you were the chair of okay. the Board Development Committee as immediate past chair. Okay. okay. So the Board Development Committee is uh, recommending the, you saw the slate in your packet, but I'll go over it. Catherine McMaines as the uh, continuous chair, Chris Shaw as vice chair, Bard Hill to move to secretary treasurer, and the reason for that is that uh, John Zaccone, who would have gladly stayed, I hope I'm not misquoting you, John, but um, he hit the, the ceiling for time served. So we had to um, get a new secretary treasurer. Uh, we're recommending Bard Hill.
Hill, Jackie Murphy as the at-large for towns over 5,000, Michael Bissonette from Heinsberg for the at-large for towns under 5,000, and I will stay on as the immediate past chair. Are there any questions about the slate? I do want to thank Bard uh, and Mike stepping up, uh, to Bard uh, to moving up to sec uh, treasurer, and then uh, Mike moving into the under five thousand category, because that turns out to be a real problem. Uh, that that we need to have more uh, rec uh, people from the uh, towns under five thousand to, uh, you know, attend the meeting so that they can serve on the executive committee. Let me also thank John Zaccone for all his service to the executive board, including a phenomenal job as the secretary treasurer. That's true. I should have recognized that first because he's been there for four years. And, and that's, that's, you know, it's hard to get people to want to be secretary treasurer. <laughs> oh, and then you fired me. What can I say? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but you were in a nice place to receive that news. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I was. Oh. But uh, I enjoyed my time and I, I highly recommend anybody who's really interested in this organization to spend some time on the executive committee. It's a much different experience and you do have uh, much larger access to just information and day-to-day -day workings simply because you're more involved, not because anything other than that. And it, it was a very rewarding experience and I Appreciate every uh, everybody's help and cooperation along the way. That's true because Forrest does a great job of helping on, on, on that part. <laughs> and I thank the staff thank for you. putting up with me all those years. No problem, John. Catherine, I saw Charlie had his hand up. I think. I, I think he was going to mention that now that John's gone, we can afford to go to Hula. <laughs> <laughs> No, that was just a thumbs up thanking John for all of his contributions. Really appreciate it there. Indeed. But basically, that's all we had to do. The, the next thing is a larger discussion, and I imagine it's you, you Charlie, on the equity update uh, and the new scope of work. Yeah, so um, you may remember in January, we reviewed uh, Creative Discourse Group. Uh, we hired them uh, probably about almost 18 months ago now. Um, and so during the during 2021, uh, a lot of community interviews and stakeholder interviews, um, and we had an equity summit in November, you'll recall, um, and that resulted in a report with some recommendations that they gave us at the end of the calendar year. We reviewed it uh, you know, fairly quickly at our January board meeting. Um, but and I think, I think maybe it, it might have been Mr. Zaccone that kind of said, well, you know, we haven't adopted all these recommendations. This is just the consultant recommendations. Um, and so here we are today, uh, a couple months later, kind of digesting that. And uh, I had started to move ahead with kind of their first recommendation, which was to hire an equity engagement manager. And... Uh, you know, after some more conversations and reflections and, and input, uh, I, I put that hiring process on hold. Um, and I think, I think at least uh, the executive committee, I think uh, so, supported that, that decision um, just to give us as an organization some more time to work through this, this issue. And I, I say this issue, like it's a simple thing. Uh, <laughs> this uh, whole host of issues uh, related to equity um, and how as an organization we really want to move forward on this topic. Um, and so pause the hiring, but then also ask the consultant team, could you come back with a, a scope of work that would help us work through uh, as a body, uh, you know, staff and board, um, how we should move forward on this work um, in a in a more uh, collaborative way where I, I guess I'll I don't know if it's uh, the right way to think about it but you know so that everybody's in the boat right and we're rowing in a similar direction most of the time uh, so knowing uh, you know this will not be perfect work by uh, any stretch um, and so 
so we put in the packet uh and i'm on i'm looking at like page 15 now in your packet um the the scope of work we have not entered into the scope of work uh it's still a draft um the equity leadership team looked at it um maybe two weeks ago now 10 days ago something uh in the last week or two made we made a few edits after that committee meeting um but uh i think the equity leadership team and and i certainly thought it was uh important to bring to the full board and see if there are any tweaks to the scope of work that would be helpful in our equity work over the coming months um and uh you'll you'll note that uh the task numbering starts with number two because <laughs> Uh, from the consultant team standpoint, the 2021 work was task one, you know, all that assessment work and uh, culminating in that uh, recommendation report. Um, so this is starting with task two. Um, and I'm going to walk through these tasks. Uh, I'm not going to read every bullet here, but I'll just kind of give you my, uh, my perception of what will be accomplished <laughs> under each task and how. Um, so the, the first task, which is titled expand and diversify the equity leadership team. And please, again, let me know if anybody wants me to share this or I'm hoping you're following along uh, on your own screen. Um, it, it talks about expanding the equity leadership team, which had been an idea the consultant had proposed from the outset, um, but we haven't done that yet. Uh, so that is still on our to-do list. Um, and you'll see that's the first major bullet there. Uh, the process to recruit new members and, of course, uh, get them on the team. And then the third bullet, also defining the role of the equity leadership team. What is their role within the CCRPC? Are they providing advice to the board? Are they providing advice to the staff? Both on what topics and when? Um, so that's something that we're hoping to get more fleshed out with um, in this task. Um, and then the second and fourth bullets are uh, a little more uh, related in my mind about our shared understanding of our approach to equity and how we move forward. And specifically, the uh, second kind of arrowhead bullet there uh, that says work with ELT to review recommendations from the consultants report, develop an equity statement and specific tasks recommended for action to the board. Um, so that work is really to hone in on uh, you know, what does the equity leadership team specifically want to recommend to the board in terms of what's our statement around equity. We don't have an organizational uh, statement of intent or inclusion, or there's a lot of uh, conversations going on around the state, different organizations have adopted you know, statements. Um, not many of them have adopted action plans. Um, and so we're trying to both get the broad statement of what we're trying to achieve with regard to equity, and then also some specific things about how we intend to do that or what's our action plan. Um, so this is maybe the most important thing uh, is having a more diverse equity leadership team and having a clear set of actions that are recommended and decided upon by the board. Um, and I think that was really my big takeaway over the last few months is that you you as a full board have not um, had the opportunity to really uh, guide the equity work uh, or direct it as as a board of directors any feedback on that that kind of big first task did it make sense or it has a comment i just had one you know what i and maybe the sequence doesn't matter but um the first item is recruit new members and then the third item is to define what the purpose of the group is and it would seem to me you define the purpose of the group before you recruit members for the group does that make sense that's a great feedback thank you any, any other comments yeah sorry Catherine. i was just going to say are there any other comments Charlie, I'll just, uh, Bard makes a great point. I was just going to say that that I believe the equity leadership team has three board members right now. We need a fourth, but maybe it's once we get the, the def definition of what it's about, 
it'll spur more interest, hopefully. Yep. Yeah, and um, another uh, topic that came up at the executive committee, sorry, there's a slight tangent, um, but uh, that I need to do more recruitment. Uh, we've had that socio-econ slash housing seat on the board has been vacant uh, pretty much for the last year since uh, Justin Dextrader moved to uh, North Carolina. So, um, you know, it may be that person, uh, depending on their interest to Mike's point you know, uh, that that might be interested in this or somebody else on the board uh, currently. So um, just a little tangent hanging out there. Any other feedback on this task? Uh, this is Wayne, uh, yeah. Wayne Howe. And I know we talked briefly, Charlie, at a meeting or two before about possibly me joining this group. And I did look at this proposal before and and looked at the minutes from the last uh, meeting that happened just what a week or two ago. And I just kept struggling with looking for things that were ultimately actionable rather than a conceptual notions about where we should be going. And, you know, maybe Mike O'Brien has a, a sense of that, but to me, it, it seems all foundational and important, but I, I just wish it sort of intimated about where this was going to go. Was this going to dip its toe into looking at regulations for affordable housing, or I'm just sort of making that up. Um, and, and, and I didn't see any of that in the consultant's proposal. And, and to me, that's what struck me that, that one of the later steps wasn't getting our hands dirty in, in kind of the regs themselves that ultimately would result in improved opportunities across the board or whatever. I, it's just, that's just my feedback. Yeah, thanks, Wayne. And, and uh, from my view, I think that is what, um, when I'm talking about specific actions, like, is that is that what we want to do? Like, let's talk about that and decide that's what we want to do. And then you know, everybody's eyes are open and, and uh, you know, you can go back and talk to your select board, and they know that that's what our board decided to focus on. Um, and that's what we haven't had that conversation yet. Yeah, thank you. And that, that could be a good one. <laughs> um, okay, I'm going to move on to uh, what they number as task three. Um, and this is a, a workshop series with staff, the ELT and the boards. So, uh, this is really more of a training task. Um, and, you know, they listed some examples of things that uh, maybe to focus on, but those are not decided. Um, and certainly, I think between the board and the ELT, you know, you can certainly guide what topics would be most helpful to hear about um, and uh, learn more about. Um, this is asking... Uh, kind of mentioning eyes wide open. Note that they're asking for you know four one and a half hour sessions. So you know that's pretty much the length of our board meetings. Uh, so you know it's going to be most of four board meetings over the next you know number of months devoted to this topic. Um, feedback on that. <clears throat> oh, somebody's choked up. Or oh, is that just Catherine? No, it's just me. <laughs> All right, just, I, I don't mean to say just Catherine. So, uh, <laughs> I hope your cough gets better. <laughs> me too. I got new medication today. <laughs> um, folks okay with uh, engaging in some more you know, learning and training on this topic? I'm going to take silence as acceptance at least, if not not enthusiastic support. Thanks, Garrett, for a thumbs up or an A-OK. -okay. Uh, oh, Jackie? It, it would be helpful to hear from other board members because um, those of us on the, on the equity group, we've been through some training and, you know, I think we all pretty much attended the, the summit and I think there was not a great representation of other board members at that summit. So it feels a little frustrating to not hear from people now. I saw Deidre's hand up, but does she still, did you still want to talk? 
think Deirdre was giving a thumbs up to training on this, but I don't. Oh, I, should, I see. I shouldn't interpret. It looked like a hand to me, so I couldn't tell. But that's, Don has a hand up. That's correct, and and I'm happy to add that I've been very appreciative of of the time and the attention and the training that the board has offered its members. I've I've, I've not quite known how to share that with the select board in my town, and I. I I welcome any suggestions on how to do that effectively, um, because I, I thought it was what I've ex what I've been able to experience. Two thumbs up. Thank you very much. Thank you. That's a that's a good thing. I'm going to uh, kind of make a note that whatever training is delivered, uh, we try to do in a way that you can share. But I think that's a that's a good point. Sorry. Dylan? Um, yeah, I just want to bring up the practical thing. It's got nothing to do so much with the uh, topic at hand, but if our, the training is going to take an hour and a half per month, and then we have regular business to do, which is another hour and a half, I can tell you that in the months of May through September, um, that is just not going to work. Don't even kid yourself that that is going to work, that we're going to be here for three and three and a half hour meetings um during the summer months or any month for that matter so be very mindful that uh, especially on zoom it's one thing to have us all in a room you can take a break you can mingle a little bit you can have something to eat three and a half hour zoom meetings are just an absolute stop don't even try thank you for that um and, and just so you know i was not thinking about three three hour meetings for you um you know, I, I'd like to, I, I care about you too much to do that to you. Uh, I, I was thinking our business meetings are probably going to be 30 minutes, right? And we, and we won't have a presentation from John Moore, right? Like um, we would just be focused largely on this. Um, you know, we have had, uh, you know, presenters and things that we probably would not have for most of this calendar year or the rest of the calendar year. That's fine. I just wanted to point out, like I said, my whole comment is just about time, not, yeah. not it's just time. Uh, and uh, do other people agree with that? Like, um, and we'll certainly work with the executive committee each month to kind of make sure the meeting is not more than outside limit two hours. Yeah, that makes sense because if, we know ahead of time, you know, how much we're scheduling. You could take a few minute, you know, five minute break, 10 minute break or something between our regular meeting and, and, and the uh, equity training so that you you come back a little more focused. Yeah. Uh, that just adds to the length of the meeting, which is, I think, what the issue is. So you still gotta do that. Person, Even I'm, if you were in, in person, if you took a break to have food or, you know, you know, as you said, take a break, whatever, it, it's still going to take time. Yeah. So that's anything I, over two hours in Zoom meetings I've been on has been a complete non-event, a complete waste. Great. And nothing to do with the RPC. I'm talking other Zoom meetings. Two hours is a real, I think, kind of max limit. Yes. Yes. Bard? Well, I was just going to observe beyond strictly duration, the... Um, ability and willingness of folks to participate in more things is always what we think of as risk factors to projects or initiatives. Um, so that's just a general comment. The more we ask of people, and I'm not saying this is low priority or anything, it's just the more we put in, the more challenging it is for many people, especially folks with multiple commitments um, outside of work and have work as well. Thank you, uh, Andy. All right, thank you. I, I want to second uh, John's comments, and I, I I don't know if I'm the only person thinking this, but I thought that the two uh, events that we had this year were interesting and uh, kept attention. Um, as as I recall, there were two. Is that correct? That we had this year, two of the equity trainings. Am I correct? Yeah. Yeah, and they were shorter. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
I'm kind of wondering if we spread to four that it's it's going to cause people to lose interest and that the effect of having that, that it will be more effective to have two meetings than rather rather than four just because it might cause people to uh, I hate to say the word zone out but when you have more and more and more uh, there's less impact on the meetings that are already had and I wonder if it was more effective to kind of go ahead with the format that we had this year perhaps with slightly different presentations or different subject matter, but I thought that it was, I question whether it's more effective to have more meetings or having fewer meetings that have more impact. Thank you. And I think that Bard, that, that kind of dovetails with what Bard said as well. Yeah. Chris? I'll build on what everybody else has been saying. And thank you, John and Andrew and Wayne for pointing out some of the things. And Jackie, even when we talk about what I've seen to date, uh, and I'm sorry I wasn't to do the summit. I think it was a Saturday or so, but there is a lot of time involved. And it seems like the more canned approach that we get from uh, creative discourse uh, is counter to engaging our interest. And I think I mentioned this before, and I'd love to see if creative discourse can actually get down into our area of expertise and begin to apply case studies and provide examples and illustrations and outcomes uh, rather than just throwing it out there. Uh, well, what's your thinking on such and such as we've had in the past thing uh, on these generalized 10,000, 100,000 foot level uh, discussions when I think we're all here with a finely sharpened pencil for stuff that relates to transportation, land use planning, and the communities in which we live. And so uh, it would be really helpful and would really get me sharpened and focused if they could do just that is provide examples from around the country uh, of situations that uh, exemplify uh, what we're, I believe, supposed to be learning about and how to deal with it. Yeah, and uh, thank you for all that feedback. And it's making me, I'll, I'll go back and talk to them also. Some of this, uh, even like reading some of the bullet points that they have here, maybe more appropriate for staff, you know, who are actually conducting the public engagement work. Like you may be interested to hear how it's going, but you don't need to be trained in how to do it, right? Like, um, I, don't, I don't know, maybe some of you want that training. I don't know, so we'll, we'll we'll flex this a little bit and also, you know, uh, try to focus it up more for the board. Uh, so it's doable. Um, one okay. thing I'm thinking, um, just looking at May to October, you know, that's like five months and we may need to stretch it out some too. Like maybe it doesn't all happen in the first four or five months. Harley, summer is tough. Yeah. Um, I agree. You know, if, if you really right. want people's time and attention, at a six o'clock meeting when it gets dark earlier and you know where we're engaged um, is uh, much more focusable if that's an actual word <laughs> than in the middle of July and August when everybody's got other things on their mind and they don't want to be in their stuffy little office on a computer so if if they really want our attention I would work that schedule yeah and and our reality just to follow up on that point John uh, which is you know, our June meeting is, I mean, that's a more of a social meeting with a 10 minute board meeting. Okay. We have, we have a, a decent business meeting in July, but we probably don't ever go more than an hour in August. We don't even have a meeting. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm with you. Summer, uh, summer's too short here in Vermont to, uh, <laughs> so sacrifice we it all. And we typically start with trainings in September anyway, when people sure. are coming back. So, I mean, it makes sense to start that <coughs> training then. Yeah, thanks. Wayne? Oh, you're muted. I just wanna underscore uh, Chris's point. It would be really good to have a case study of here's what they did in Cumberland County over in Maine, you know, to get rid of redlining or whatever the deal is that we would then have something to reflect upon the kind of actions we might take rather than a more generic assessment of our own internal values, if you will. I just think it might be a little more useful. Uh, so I just want to underscore his point. Thanks. Thank you, Wayne. 
any other comments before uh, Charlie goes on with the um, discussion? I don't see any other comments currently. Um, so the uh, the number four task is, um, it, it says equitable review of the UPWP. Um, I'm not sure that's exactly the right phrase, but um, no. we uh, did have some conversation with them just, and I think this is actually following up on the point that uh, Chris and Wayne just made. Um, how do we actually you know, apply some equity thinking into our actual projects. Um, we've, you know, we, and we've dipped a toe in this. We've had an equity impact worksheet where we look at where we need to do more public engagement. Um, and we've been, you know, carrying out those efforts, you know, whether in Winooski or the old North End in particular, uh, where we have done significantly more engagement to try to engage underrepresented communities. Um, and I think this is a little bit of an effort to try to apply some work. Um, uh, and so, that, that's what this task is about. And and sorry, Bart, I don't know, did you want to, are you going backwards or on this task? No, it's really this one. And um, I appreciate that comment because uh, consistent with what people just said a few minutes ago, when I read this, it reads like they will do it and tell us what the results are, which I think, well, that's fine. But what we really want is to embed that process in our own staff and our own process. So they aren't doing it for us. They're helping us to stand up a process where we do it ourselves. Does that make sense? Yes, uh, like that's, uh, that was absolutely the intent part. Thank you. I'll try to make that clear. I'm sorry, Catherine, did I cut you off? No, no, I was just going to say I agree with that. Mm -hmm. it, it just didn't read well. <laughs> For one thing, because you really do want to know, you want to learn how to do it rather than have somebody tell you what it is. Yep. Yep. Good. Thank you. Um, so task five uh, is just kind of a generic, you know, we've kind of uh, had them on call, if you will, on various situations that have come up over the last year, uh, you know, might have been a specific project or um, our relationship with a specific group. Uh, where we kind of say, hey, can you give us some advice on how to uh, handle this situation? You know, I think maybe following up on the points you were just making, <laughs> like uh, how, how can we best approach this or how, what would be a more productive way to approach uh, this relationship? Um, so this is, you know, a little bit of on-call task, to be honest. Um, any feedback on, on that coaching and consultation with staff? Okay. Um, and then uh, number six here uh, was really kind of following up on because we had that convening in uh, November and there was discussion in at the end of that session about um, how do we follow up? How do we uh, use our position in the community to host or facilitate or sponsor <laughs> um, and, and particularly uh, with all of our municipalities, the ones that are engaging in this work, how do we provide uh, maybe a forum for them to share. Um, so we're not telling anybody what to do at those meetings, but more uh, allowing for group learning, uh, you know, across municipalities. Um, and so this was, uh, I think, intended to be some support uh, to us to support those convenings. Any feedback on that? And I don't see any comments right now. No, any hands. Oh, all right. I think that's a, an applause symbol from Garrett. And a, yeah. Oh, a Martin up. has a hand oh. up. Oh, is that a hand no. up? Yeah, I'm sorry. I, in, I think I may have said this in a earlier different meeting that I'm struck that we're, that we're using different words sort of interchangeably at times, I think. So we're using inequity, um, equity, justice, racial justice. So uh, I still ponder, is this focused on racial justice or is it broader? Um, and so that's just a question. And I think we should just be consistent with our language and our focus, if that makes sense. And maybe this is where we start. It's a conversation that we've had before that we start 
with racial justice and their the broader work is more inclusive, I think of things like gender identity, disability, age, things that have come up elsewhere. Um, and so it's just a comment. It's more about the semantics and focus than anything. Yeah, thanks, Bart. And uh, we did have some conversation with the consultant team. Uh, and this is, uh, and I apologize for not actually starting with that because uh, you've made that point to me two or three times and I, uh, I don't seem to pick it up too well. But, um, but I did hear you um, and had a conversation with the consultant team. Um, and, and I think they do agree, like we are ultimately trying to address equity more broadly because, you know, and just from a, a, even a legal requirement on us, both from federal government and state government, uh, we're supposed to be engaging all uh, a, a pretty wide array of underrepresented communities and Bard just listed off a bunch of them. Uh, you know, and, and different identities that can be overlapping. Um, and so it's not uh, just racial equity or racial justice. And, um, but we may come back to, to address all those broader uh, equity for all those underrepresented uh, or marginalized communities. We may do some targeted work initially on racial uh, equity. So I, I'm not clear on that yet either, but I, I do want to kind of put, uh, put a flag out there that um, we do have to address equity in the broadest sense. Um, and you know, we may get specific at times, but ultimately the, I, I believe the objective needs to be broad uh, and not narrow. If that's helpful, Bart, sorry. Um, uh, Garrett? Um, I'm going to be crass and mention money. Um, I may be missing something here, but uh, looking at number four, they're talking about eight hours. And as far as I know, it's two of them. And that one works out to $1,500 an hour. Now, I'm being a consultant, I'm good with consultants making good money, but um, it seems like a great deal of money. And as I say, I must be missing something there. Um, and just wondered if what it is I'm missing. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for your crassness, I guess. Uh, uh, but, uh, but I think, uh, um, so I, I think it's a good question. I'll follow up with them on that. I, I, I don't think you necessarily, well, I think if you're missing something, it's in that first line of the uh, lightly shaded box that follows the title row on the top of page four of working with several, so several TCDG consultants. So there's, there's two members of this firm but they have um, what they refer to as associate consultants. Um, so there's kind of a broader network of consultants that they use and they bring in on a task basis. So that's a good question. I'm not sure how many people they're thinking about bringing in to this task, Garrett, um, and, and what that works out to. <laughs> so we'll, I'll have some conversation about that. Oakley, Oakley. All right. Well, thank you very much. That was, that was really helpful. Um, I hope it was helpful to you to um, feel a little bit more a part of this conversation because uh, I was definitely having a lot of anxiety about the board members not being a part of the conversation. Well, thank you for the, um, the effort. I mean, I think it was really good comments that have been made. Moving along, you get to keep talking, though. Oh my God! <laughs> the executive director report. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> with apologies to you all. Um, okay, um, so a hiring update. I already covered that the equity manager is on pause. Uh, we'll see when we're ready to come back to that. Then maybe you know fall. Um, and I mentioned the business office associate. Uh, the advertisement for that just went out last week. Um, and did you, I don't know that you all saw the advertisement. Did you see the advertisement? Mm -hmm. No. 
I see a couple of notes. Uh, we will forward it to you in case you know somebody who might be a good fit. Um, you know, it's more of a, uh, you know, more, I, don't know, I was going to say entry level. I don't know if that's the right term, but um, we don't need somebody with a lot of experience. I'll put it that way. Um, or a lot of education. I think we're, you know, looking for somebody with an interest in, you know, bookkeeping and financial management uh, to help the team. So, uh, Forrest, is that a fair characterization? Yep, it is. Thanks. Um, yeah, so we'll we'll send you that uh, job ad, and please send anybody you uh, know that might be a good fit our way. Um, any questions on that? Um, uh, just a heads up, item B there is just a heads up that the uh, the input that we get into VTrans Capital Project projects uh, for FY twenty four um, is. Uh, happening, I think, at your next meeting, Christine or Eleni, does I have that right? Um, so this is a heads up that I'll be an action item next month. Yes, it will be. Yeah, so and it's focused on bridges. Yes. So um, it may be a little simpler conversation than we had last year when we were looking at, you know, roadways and safety projects. Um, item C is just uh, information item to let you know um, that we were involved with two raise grants. Um, which is a USDOT discretionary grant program. Uh, you may be familiar with it from past years. It was called BUILD under, I think that was under the Trump administration. And I think it was called Tiger Grants under the Obama administration. So this program has been around for a while with different names, depending on who's in office. Um, but it's really a, a, a discretionary program where there's some good amount of money available. Um, We've been a supporting partner with VTrans and the cities of Winooski and Burlington, bless you, Tony, um, on the Main Street Bridge between Winooski and Burlington. Um, and VTrans is applying for a $25 million capital grant uh, to replace that bridge. Um, so that, that will be a big deal if we are able to uh, get that um, and just more construction for Winooski on the horizon. Yeah, Mike says, yay. Um, <laughs> uh, and the second one is something is a grant that um, the RPC applied for directly, more of a planning grant uh, to really look at how uh, we can support uh, economic development, housing, and transit services in downtowns in our larger kind of commuting region. So Franklin County, Washington County, Addison County, uh, and even going down to Rutland, um, they were kind of interested uh, also. And so uh, we submitted that. It's like a $2 million grant because it's the geography we're talking about is so extensive. Um, so um, we, and this is, we've submitted similar grants the last three years. So, um, you know, the fourth time might be the charm. And uh, we will see. And thank you uh, to Eleni and Marshall for all the work that they uh, put into that. Um, and we'll hear about that. I think maybe August timeframe is what they're targeting decisions. Um, and then finally, legislative update. Um, there's, well, the big news, I, well, big news for the RPC <laughs> uh, parochial budget was I covered in the budget, which is the legislature uh, was very supportive of RPCs in a variety of ways, regional planning, energy, water quality, and transportation. Um, and so uh, that's, that's been very positive and, you know, slightly potentially overwhelming. Um, uh, so, you know, kind of getting loved to death. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping that all works. Um, and then on policy issues, uh, still debates about exactly how the legislature is going to address Act 250 or any changes that come in Act 250. Uh, part of that is in the omnibus housing bill. There's also an omnibus economic development bill. Um, not clear to me at all how those are going to turn out in the next two or three weeks. Uh, so just stay tuned. Um, you know, I think there'll be some tweaks in different programs and different incentives out there for both economic development and housing. Um, and maybe a little bit of permit uh, improvement or change anyway, I don't know. Um, and Regina, is there anything you want to add about those uh, two or three bills? No, nothing else. Um, and then the last thing I want to mention the, in the legislature, 
just kind of came up over the last week or two um, is that uh, Senate Transportation Committee uh, included a, a provision in the transportation bill to have us um, in, engaged to some extent in an examination of the governance of the Burlington International Airport. Um, and so that's uh, getting discussed tomorrow in um, Senate Economic Development Committee. Um, and you know we'll, we'll see if, if it gets through the process for uh, both uh, you know, the conference committee of both houses. But um, I think it's just something that uh, looks like they're asking VTrans to kind of fund and uh, hire a consultant. Uh, to be kind of a neutral party to kind of look at the issues over the years about governance and and see if they can come up with any recommendations that um, and, they, and they have a, a pretty defined list of folks that they're appointing uh, to the group uh, with us called out in that section two or three times. Um, one was um, you know it, having me be on there as a non-voting member, okay. Um, the second that was uh, us, the CCRPC, so this would be something that would come back to you appointing uh, a member of the General Aviation Committee, or I'm sorry, General A Aviation Community at the airport to be on this, uh, I don't know if it's called a task force or advisory committee, something like that. Um, and then also um, for us to uh, find and appoint uh, someone to represent underrepresented communities that are impacted by the airport operations. Um, so I'm um, not quite sure who that is or exactly how to do that, um, but it was interesting. And uh, I just was not aware of that until today. Um, so that's uh, a little bit of um, evolving conversation going on about looking at the airport. John, did you wanna pipe in there? Yeah, why do we have any interest in this? This is a mud flinging contest between the two um, cities, South Burlington and Burlington. And quite frankly, I don't want any part of this. I don't want us to have any part of this. I will I will con convey that, well, uh, that individual sentiment tomorrow. Uh, unless the unless board um, wants or, to take it. You know, or not. <laughs> What'd you say, Chris? I said the option is always there to not transfer that information. Obviously, you know, this is a topic that uh, the General Assembly wants to look at. So I think it's a prudent look uh, at this point in time. There are more than one town, South Burlington, that's affected by this, Colchester, Essex, Winooski. Uh, you know, it's got to be looked at to see what are the pros and cons of having a single municipality controlling uh, what is an international airport it's in the best interests of the state i think to look at that too so i i disagree with john and, and, and that comes from someone's town who's flinging the mud so i would still say that we should have no part of this whatsoever okay cool. yeah sorry i saved that one for last i think i'm welcome to uh, get any other viewpoints uh, uh that would uh, help me have conversation with the legislators. I have no clue. <laughs> Don't bark. So, um, so this is just for historical perspective. You think back of what the the terrain around the airport looked like when the airport was first put there. In my opinion, that's when the mud started, it was a mud airfield um, surrounded by not very much other than fields and farms. Um, and so what we have is um, the greater metropo metropolitan area that's grown up around it since, what was it, 1919, something like that, when they first started landing planes there. Um, so I, I think it, this illustrates for me that we are sort of, we are the heirs to development by accident you know you put an airfield outside of town and suddenly it's not outside of town anymore over a period of 100 years for what that's right garrett um just to muddy the waters further i don't know what the arguments between south burlington and burlington are and don't really care 
Um, is there anybody in this meeting who hasn't flown out of that airport? Um, it's a regional airport, and I believe that's a part of our commission's name. And therefore, I think it's important that we have something to say about it. That's all. Thank you, Garrett. Yeah, and just, uh, I don't know if this helps or not, but does uh, the language I saw today um, does have me on there as a non-voting member? Um, and I, I think that was a, partly my response to their suggestion because I was like, I don't, uh, well, and this may not be right. My perception only, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure that this body, the RPC board is going to be able to take a clear position, you know, on resolving issues, but uh, happy to support the group having a conversation. Um, I think was kind of the way I phrased it um, when I was speaking with Senate Transportation. So that's that's where how it got there. But just uh, and John, I don't know if that's helpful or not to know. I don't think they're the uh, at least that committee was looking for this body to take a position. Still, if you're involved, when you speak, it sort of comes with us in the background. Mm -hmm. And I, I, again, this is a turf war between yep. two individual municipalities that I don't think we should or really have any business getting involved in. The legislature's gotten dragged into this because they've been lobbied by uh, uh, those municipalities. And, and I, we've had this chat in small increments before and i still maintain we need to stay as far away as absolutely possible from this and not be involved this is not about anything but the turf war and let it let them fight it out and it really does not matter to us because it's not about service it's not about how all the rest of our municipalities can access the flights there it's not about how well it runs or how well it doesn't run. It's just 100% turf war, and we should stay 100% away from it. Well, to follow up with you, John, since it, you know, because it really is more than just the region, um, it, it, as they put it, it's a, as you said, it's an international airport. So is that why the state, I mean, you'd think the state would be much more involved than it is, but is it, it's probably they don't want to get involved either. <laughs> Yeah, Bard made reference. There's a long history of the airport, you know, predating the current systems, right? I mean, yeah, like you would think that the state would be much more involved, given how important the airport is to the state itself. I, I believe the state would be involved if there was an actual problem. There is no actual problem. It's a turf war, and that's granted my opinion but there is no problem. It's a turf war. And that's why we should stay away from it. If there was an actual problem, people who needed to be involved would be involved. Thank you. Are we ready to move on? Um, I kind of would like Charlie to have a little bit of an idea of what the commission really thinks if he's gonna talk to the legislature. I, I really, I, you know, this is probably the most important thing we've talked about all night. I want our hands, I, I, I move that Charlie tells the uh, legislature that the RPC does not want to be involved. Okay, uh, is there a second on that for discussion? I'll second it just for discussion. Thank Dan, you. Karen. All right, uh, this calls for a discussion. Uh, uh, well, we've heard can I make John, a comment? Heard a little bit from Chris. Uh, any other comments uh, from other people uh, in the in the commission? Yes. Um, whoops, wrong hand. I wanted to raise my hand, but anyways, um, if I could just comment briefly, I I agree with John. Um, this has been something that's going on for a long time. There's more to the airport. I mean, we call it an international airport. The actual international aspect of it is somewhat limited, real, realistically compared to any other international airport in the country, probably. Um, it's also very important to the Defense Department for, you know, having our fighter wing, fighter wing there with the F-35s. Um, so, our involvement in the 
the dispute between Burlington and control over the airport and what have you. I kind of agree with John. I think that's something that they have they have skin in the game more so than any of us. And for us to, to as, as much as we could say we, we have involvement with it, would be to say that we have involvement with um, IBM being in Essex Junction. It, it's, it's, it, it impacts the whole county. We do, we do weigh in on those things, but it's kind of a more local issue between those municipalities as far as I'm concerned. Thank you, Dan. Uh, Chris? Well, I'm just gonna reiterate, I think uh, we don't need to belabor our points that uh, I see it as more than a turf war. You, we're in the business of doing planning. We gotta be looking 30 years out. Is this model gonna be something that's sustainable for the next 30 years? Uh, and I really think that this is a, uh, Chittenden County uh, decision, in, at the very least, if not a statewide decision, as to who they would want to be operating the airport in the longer term. We can wait till there's a problem, but I think by then it's too late. I think, you know, it really needs to be evaluated. We all know what happens to these study committees in Montpelier. They're going to do their study and then stick it on a shelf and nothing may happen for 30 or 40 years, but at least the process is being discussed and looked at. I think it's really important. We do uh, get involved and I appreciate what Charlie's done as a non-voting member because it does keep us in an apolitical situation, which I think is very important here. But running away from a potential look-see, uh, I, I just think that's uh, uh, sticking your head in the sand. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Garrett? Um, I, Charlie, could you give a little more description of what this is about? Uh, from what I heard from you, yes, we know about the turf wars. I don't care about that. But it sounded like there was more to this than just who's the boss or whatever. Could you go into that a little bit? Maybe there isn't more to it. I I don't uh, know. Yeah, give me a moment. I'm uh, actually pulling up the. Uh, yeah, you know, there's kind of a, a to do list of uh, yeah you know, the agenda for this. I'm oh, sorry, I'm scrolling a little too fast. Um, but uh, so sorry, going from my memory. Oh wait, I'm getting closer. Um, you know, it was really to look at the governance and this is, you know, I don't know, I think, I don't know who made reference, but it's not a new issue. It been, was looked at in 1985. It was looked at, you know, by the airport commission, I don't know, maybe in the last 10 years, um, and maybe a couple other times. Um, and so it was kind of, I think the, the language now calls for this group to, uh, well, for VTrans to hire a consultant um, for the, and the secretary would be on this committee um, amongst others and to, re to review those uh, previous uh, suggestions or recommendations that came out of the previous looks at this and decide which of them were worth looking at. Um, okay, and so here's, here's the creation language, one sentence to examine the existing governance structure and alternatives to the existing governance structure of the airport and report to the committees um, and report the committee's findings and recommendations. So, um, you know, it does, that's, that's it. Um, so it is, so it is purely about governance. Yep. And the members that they have here right now, uh, one member de designated by the mayor of Burlington, one member designated by the council, of the city of Burlington, one uh, voting member by the city council of South Burlington, one voting member by the mayor of Winooski, um, one member, I mentioned this, by the RPC to represent individuals uh, such as BIPOC, comma, immigrants, comma, individuals with low income, oh. in individuals residing in disadvantaged communities, uh, adversely affected by the airport, um, one member, uh, one voting member designated by the RPC to represent the general aviation organizations at the airport. 
the Secretary of Transportation, one voting member designated by the CEO of the Lake Champlain Chamber, um, the Director of Aviation non-voting, the Director of the RPC non-voting. So just if that gives you a little more flavor of detail, sorry, I should have started with that. So we would be appointing two members as well as your showing up? Yep. So, okay. Well, in some ways, uh, appointing a member of the underrepresentative um, goes along with our new look at equity. I think that's important. And so that, that does make a lot of sense. Um, yeah, and I, their thinking is that you have a broader range of people to draw from the same way with the aviation community. Uh, it is nice to know that the state is more involved and because I go, you know, I, I listen, I don't, you know, I don't have a dog, I don't have anything in this game because I'm out here in Jericho. <laughs> I just hear the F-35s go over every once in a while. But, um, you know, I, I understand the turf wars to a certain extent. And I, you know, certainly having uh, that uh, Jericho was one of the uh, community members that had uh, a larger number of uh, Air National Guard uh, represented. We had a plane named after us. Uh, and that, uh, you know, so Dan's comments are well taken that, you know, we have the guard there. Uh, and then of course, you know, Chris is talking about sustainability. It, it's good to see that the state is taking more of an interest because to me, it, it, it seems like the state needs to have much more of uh, a long-term thinking about what the airport is and who and how it is sustained over time as far as my thinking is concerned at the moment. Uh, okay, Wayne. I just wanted to say something contrary to what uh, your statement is we live out in Jericho, so we're not so af affected. But we're not it, close to it, so to speak. Yeah, as, as I became involved in the select board, I, I learned this is all pre-COVID. There were, they're not quite commuters, but uh, people who regularly, because we're only 20, 25 minutes from the airport, live in Jericho, Richmond or whatever, and they're hopping on a plane to DC or hopping on a plane to Chicago quite regularly. So I think we do have some skin in the game here. I'll just mention that. I, just, well, um, you think, you know, there. I mean, because my thinking is not so much skin in the game because of, uh, you know, uh, proximity in terms of uh, organization, but I think, you know, because it makes sense that the state has more involvement because it does impact so many other communities. Uh, Deidre? Yeah, I would say um, welcome this opportunity to participate in the conversation, even if just for the opportunity to recruit and, and nominate somebody from, from the marginalized communities. Um, I feel like they have a very important voice and, and probably have not had an opportunity to participate in these conversations. And I suppose we could, we could consider it an honor that, that our organization has been designated as the one um, which may be appropriate to, to recommend such a participant. Actually, if I heard Charlie right, he's the one that's participating and in, in speaking on behalf of those. We are not recommending that someone from those alternate, those um, communities um, wind up on the committee itself. So no, John, yeah, that's, I'm sorry, you missed, uh, that's, uh, I did not say what you just said. I said the, the board is appointing somebody to represent those, those underrepresented communities. Okay, I, I misinterpreted that then when, I thought you said that was your role as the uh, non-voting member. No, no, the, there are two members that they want the RPC to appoint one to uh, represent those disadvantaged communities, I guess is what they have in quotes in there. And then also the general aviation uh, community or organizations at the airport. I, I still say the legislature is attempting to drag people that we would nominate into a turf war and you're setting them up for doing nothing but being involved in a turf war. You're not setting them up to actually have any input in anything because this is nothing about who about anything except who runs the airport. 
It's not about the services that it gives. It's not about anything else except who runs the airport. And I'm sorry, but this is South Burlington trying to drag the rest of us into the mud and we and, and appoint people who are gonna be unwillingly dragged into the mud by us doing it. And we need to stay completely away from this. All right, John, uh, any other comments? Well, we have, well, the floor is open. Yeah, I just- I, I, Andy? Oh, and, no, yeah. Andy, you go. Sure, so I'm finding myself in a little bit of an awkward position here because I don't really know what the city of Burlington would want to do. I haven't had that conversation on this. So um, I'm actually going to abstain from this vote. I mean, I'm, and I'm happy to do what is being directed by the legislature if they're asking us to take certain steps, um, as long as we're staying more or less neutral, as long as I don't know what the city wants. But given that I don't know what, you know, what Burlington would really want to do in this situation. Um, I don't normally abstain from votes like this, but I will be on this one because I just don't want to vote against what the city might be wanting to do and what their position might be. So noted, Andy. Uh, Jackie? Well, I sort of following what Andy said, is this really a choice? If if there's legislation that's a point that's saying the Chittenden County Regional Planning Commission will be uh, on this board or, you know, uh, even and make the appointments it, am i misunderstanding it um, they're asking charlie for his our input uh, on whether or not we do get involved at this point in time there's no, yeah, there's, no there's no law yet obviously if they if we wind up in there i think that's a different conversation and you know, there's a bill that that's a, becomes law and we're involved. That's one thing. This is about should we be involved at all? And are we directing our, our um, my, my motion was, are we directing our executive director to tell the legislature we're not interested in being in this as part of the law? Not that oh. we, we will go against the law if that's what it is. Okay, thanks for that clarification. That, that helps me to under, because I'm reading what Charlie just sent. I'm like, wait a minute, do we have a choice? So... Yeah, Garrett. Um, well, I'm now thoroughly confused. It isn't law yet. So it seems to me since there is no law, there is nothing currently to do. I've been reading through it uh, from the link that Charlie put in the uh, chat. And it is a proposed law. So all we could do at the moment is to advise on this, um, depending on how people feel. But if it does go into law, then we don't have any choice. We are required by law to do it. So I'm not sure what you're saying you want us to do or not do, John. My, you know, my motion, I, I don't understand the motion. My, my motion is to have Charlie tell the legislature when he meets with them. Is it tomorrow, Charlie? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, the, so I started this with the context of um, I've been asked to testify tomorrow morning about this. So I'm asking, um, my motion was to direct our executive director during his testimony to tell the legislature that their RPC does not want to be involved. Now, if they listen to that, that's up to them. If they put us in, that's a whole different conversation. I am in no way making a motion that we will ignore the law as written. This is, they're forming the law at the moment. And my motion was about nothing but directing Charlie to tell the legislature that the RPC uh, commission does not wish to be involved in this discussion. Jackie, you still have a comment? No. Is your hand still up? So I didn't know. Uh, okay. uh, so is there any other comments? Any, uh, so <clears throat> I guess that, <clears throat> I guess we're ready to vote on the uh, uh, John's motion and given I think probably we'll have to do it uh, with the little hand thingies, if I can figure out how to use it myself. <laughs> uh, 
or you can just raise your hand on, on the video screen. That's true, either one, because that it, it it's not going to be a uh, all in one vote. I think there'll be a, a variety of votes. So if people are in favor of John's motion to tell the legislature not to get us involved, uh, uh, then vote yes. If you disagree, vote no. Is that that does that clear? Is that clear, John? Yeah, okay. clear to me. All right, uh, so everybody uh, uh, who's in favor of the motion, raise your hands. Uh, okay, all those who are voting no, raise your, oh wait, there's one more question. I see Amy's, oh, Amy's hand up. Okay, she's going to vote no, correct? You have a- No, a, you need to allow an option for um, abstaining as well. That's true. I was going to do that last. Okay, just make it sure. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. Be careful when you raise your hand, Amy. Um, yeah. so, but, um, That's why I was concerned. <laughs> I wanted to make sure you had- you I, only caught two, I only caught two yes votes. Was that, was that all there was? That's what I saw. So the next was going to be uh, uh, all those- uh, again, uh, voting no, raise your hands. Uh, okay, I'll do that myself. Okay. Uh, and those, after Charlie gets the votes. Um, we'll do the abstentions. Did you uh, get all of them? <laughs> so I got... Um... As no votes, I got uh, Chris, Jackie, Garrett, Andy from Williston, and Kurt from Underhill. Any other no votes? Oh, and no. Milton. Uh, and my, Winooski. Winooski. Sorry. I had it my hand. And mine. Oh, and, and uh, Charlotte. Okay, thank you. And Jackie. I got her. Okay. And Garrett, you got Garrett? Yep. Okay. Yep, thank you. Okay, and then abstentions. Uh, that's Amy and Andy Montreal. Yes. yes. Well, thank you for everybody's comments. I think that this was a very good discussion. Um, and it, you know, it's it's not an easy task. Yeah. And just, um, but uh, thank you, John, for uh, you know, uh, pushing the conversation. So. I, I can convey, you know, there's not unanimous support for, for engagement. And frankly, we didn't have a vote saying we definitely want to engage, right? Uh, we right. just had to, a motion did not pass to not engage. Sorry, to use a double negative, right? Um, so, all right, I will try to finesse that in my conversation tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. So, oh, if we're ready to, oh, Chris, you have a comment? I think we were going on. I was reading you, uh, leading you by going to number 12. And I was going to suggest we could have governance of the Burlington Airport on a future agenda topic. <laughs> Let me first give the, the, the very brief that your committee and liaison activities and reports are either in your packet or your link, depending on your choice. <laughs> and now, now you're good, number 12. <laughs> Sorry, jump the gun, as I said. But that's that that's that's probably a worthwhile a very worthwhile discussion based on what we just had. I, I think what's important to uh, South Burlington is that we see wider representation, uh, and I disagree with the turf war uh, characterization of the thing. I think uh, you know just to follow up that Williston you barely hear about and seem to be um, uh, as effective as South Burlington in ways. And I work in Williston right underneath the whole thing, so. As a regional economic driver, nobody can compete with uh, the airport. It's wonderful. So uh, I think we want to see the value of the airport, but we also want to see that uh, the region is invested in it more than, uh, you know, perhaps it is at the moment. And it goes to what is Burlington going to be like uh, politically? Uh, and how does that then uh, reflect on the county and the state? So there you go. Thank you, Chris. Uh, anybody have anyone else have any other topics they'd like to have discussed in the future? I'll just bring up that the equity leadership committee meeting. Uh, I don't know if it was Jackie or, or, or Elaine 
um, we talked about having something about the equity uh, every every meeting just to keep it on the plate. Okay, Dan. Just furthering the discussion on the airport issue, just I find it interesting that uh, in regards to Chris speaking about the other communities weighing in on the governance or the um, management of the airport rather than just Burlington um, or South Burlington, but the community as a whole, as an MPO, we don't have all the communities in our county voting on MPO business. It's just MPO um, communities. So using the same logic, everybody in, in our county should be voting on MPO projects. If, 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 if I read it right or understand it right. Thank you. Oh. All right. Uh, any other future agenda topics out there that people would like to have? I mean, uh, you know, because equity is important. A lot of uh, issues right now. Uh, all right. Well, if there's no other items for agenda, uh, are there members items or other business? Nobody has any other things to talk about. <laughs> it's really interesting. Well, if we adjourn, this is That's Garrett. That's exactly where we are then, now. Garrett. You got it. <laughs> Do we have a second? Second. Andy, you have any six. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Thank you very much for your comments. Good night, all.